Hi everybody, this is Gino Vanelli. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the producers and or the persons appearing on the program. Today on Rainbow Country, my TIFF 2020 coverage continues with the filmmakers of the new trans film, No Ordinary Man. Plus, a flashback to TIFF 2019 with my interview featuring TIFF's senior director of film, Diana Sanchez. And... Rainbow Country contributor, HIV long-term survivor and community activist, Colin Johnson shares his views on COVID-19 and mental health. Stay tuned for Gay Talk Radio right here on Rainbow Country. Hi, this is Carol Pope. Hi, I'm Garrett Conley, author of Boy Erased, a memoir. Hi, I'm Lorraine Segato. Hi, I'm Gord Depp of the Spoons. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. Well, hello and welcome to a fresh episode of Rainbow Country, as I like to call it, and have been calling it for the last five seasons. Say it with me, a little gay radio show working to give voice to the LGBT community and beyond. There you go. Thank you so much for participating. (laughs) As always, I am your tour guide through Rainbow Country, a Mark Tara. By the way, Rainbow Country originates from CIUT-FM in Toronto, the sound of your city. And now proudly in syndication on Bombshell Radio, Love Your Indie, a 24-7 streaming outlet, and Real Music, Real Ideas, Real People, CKUWFM, Winnipeg, The Juice, CJUCFM, Whitehorse, plus The Mighty, CKCU-FM, Ottawa, and the voice of the Halliburton Highlands, Canoe FM, Halliburton, Ontario's cottage country. So whether you're listening in the Yukon, the Prairies, Ontario's cottage country, Southern Ontario, even down to Buffalo, New York, or online, it is because of you listening, streaming, downloading that has taken this little gay program and made it into a syndicated radio show and a number one LGBT podcast. And last week, Rainbow Country was number two on Podomatic's gay and lesbian chart. So today, my TIFF 2020 coverage continues with the filmmakers of the new trans film, No Ordinary Man. I chat with co-directors Ashling Chin Yi and Chase Joint to find out more about this documentary that tells the story of trans jazz artist Billy Tipton through the lens of current day trans artists. Plus a flashback to TIFF 2019 with my interview featuring TIFF's senior director of film, Diana Sanchez. But up first... Rainbow Country contributor, HIV long-term survivor and community activist, Colin Johnson shares his views on COVID-19 and mental health. I want to talk about something that I think is really important to our community. A couple of days ago, I had a conversation with my psychiatrist. Yes, I do keep one because I think mental health is really impactful, especially in these times of COVID. For people, for us in the African Caribbean and Black LGBTIQ community, we rarely talk about mental health. I know that we sort of pay it lip service, but for the most part, when we think about mental health, we sort of just just patch it as him crazy, make him go but him weird. Mental health is crucial to how we live our lives. It impacts our wellness, 
our peace of mind, the way we deal with others, the way we deal with life. <clears throat> so I want to make this as clear as I possibly can. Reach out, talk to your friends, have a support service, have someone you can trust, who you can vent with, be it about work or about people, your frustrations in life. It's crucial for us all to make sure that we are able to go through this with a clear, clean attitude. There are so many possibilities and so many services that are available now. Uh, governments have sort of reached out in many ways and provided call-in supports. The, there's Cam H in Toronto. Um, there are so many others. Uh, you know, go online, Google where you are. I'm sure you'll find the supports that you need, especially if you're being impacted, beat by depression, frustration. These are things we face. And, you know, we have to be honest about this. We have to make sure that we are getting the help and assistance that we need. So, again, let's have these discussions. Let's talk openly about the fact that I feel like crap in the day when I get up. I'm not sleeping well. The more and the more that we can speak about these issues, the better it is that we can get the assistance that we need. There are counselors, and as I say, you know, I have a psychiatrist. I speak to him once a month. I vent, I cuss, I go on badly. And the beauty of it is I know he can't tell anybody. I mean, it's protected, right? So again, let's make sure that we are getting the help we can. This is Colin Johnson. I'm an HIV long-term survivor and an LGBTIQ activist. Canada's LGBTQ2 Plus archives just released. Out North, an archive of queer activism and kinship in Canada. Order a copy from your local bookstore to dive into hundreds of loud and proud stories and photos of historical queer life in Canada from pre-1939 to today. Get your copy from your local bookstore. Out North, an archive of queer activism and kinship in Canada. Speak love to me and soon. Hello, music lovers. This is jazz vocalist Adi Braun. I'm thrilled to be able to make live music again and excited to share with you that on September 17th at Toronto's premier jazz venue, the Jazz Bistro, I will be performing with the wonderful Adrian Ferruja on piano. Please join us for an evening of two musical sets featuring songs from several of my tribute shows. The music starts at 8 p.m. and the cover is $15. Seating at the Jazz Bistro will be very limited and reservations are a must for this event, so please call 416-363-5299 to book your table now. Hope to see you there. My name is Charles Officer and I'm the writer and director of Invisible Essence to Little Prince. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. Twenty nineteen marked my second year covering the Toronto International Film Festival, or TIFF. Now in its forty fifth year. By the way, do you know the original name for the film festival? In nineteen seventy five, the festival's original name was the Festival of Festivals. There you go. You're welcome. Up next, a flashback to TIFF 2019 with my interview featuring TIFF's Senior Director of Film, Diana Sanchez. Good evening, everyone. How are you? Whoa. You guys are excited, aren't you? Hello, Toronto! This is a very exciting night for us. I'm really freaking excited to be here tonight. What a great audience. I'm so, so excited to be here. It's 
such a great honor. I am so honored to be able to show my film to this august crowd. What's really fun is people who love film, and you are all that, and we're very proud and happy to be here with all of you. We should not be afraid to tell stories because we are afraid that people will judge. Thank you for giving us the opportunity and a platform to be able to showcase our work as female filmmakers. This is for my parents who couldn't come, so thank you. I'm going to prove it to them. I did it! I've just realized what TIFF actually stands for. Toronto is fucking fantastic. <laughs> this is the story of our city, and we're a very proud city, and I want the world to see it. Diana Sanchez, hello. Hello, thank you for having me. You, oh, first of all, you are the senior director of film. This is a new pr- uh, position. Talk to me about you and being the senior director of film and what this means, specifically at TIFF. So, yes, it is a new position. Um, I oversee the festival programming as well as the year-round programming at the TIFF Bell Lightbox. So that includes the Cinematheque and our new releases as well as our film circuit, which travels all around Canada. I think... So um, you're the person to know. (laughs) I guess so. (laughs) I think uh, what I, what's exciting about it and why the position makes so much sense is it's a way of integrating what we do at festival into what we do at, at the Lightbox Year Round and vice versa. And having that, um, you know, those links between what we do at, that, at the Lightbox Year Round, mm-hmm. I think, is really important. Is there any sort of confusion when it comes to... TIFF and the film festival compared to TIFF, the light box, and what happens 365 days of the year. Is there any sort of confusion between the two? I wouldn't, no, I wouldn't say confusion. Um, Definitely uh, an event like TIFF, the festival, you know, it's a live event. It's 11 days of the year. And it has, um, it is really, it brings people from all around the world to Toronto and what we want to do is bring some of that year round okay to the light box but obviously you could not sustain a festival you know <laughs> for year 365 days a year right. but you can definitely have moments of that uh throughout the year which is exciting you know what one of the things that we love to do is to bring guests bring incredible films and and really create a space of engagement and community. Um, so I think that the Lightbox does that, the festival does that, and the film circuit, which travels across Canada, also does that. I was fortunate enough to see Paris is Burning. There was right. you guys programmed that uh, in in the earlier in the summer in the summer yeah. of 2019, and it was a restored version. Fantastic. I'd never seen it on the big screen, but it was so exciting to be part of that. Part of, thank you so much for doing that. Yeah, that's one of the, the things that, that's a, the type of event that, we, that continues that kind of spirit year round. And it's so incredible to see like, films that you love and know on the big screen. Mm. And I think the light box provides that, that opportunity. So you look after the films all year round in regards to what's being programmed? I oversee that, correct. Um, you, underneath, you know, with Cameron Bailey, who's our artistic mm-hmm. director, we oversee what's happening year-round at the Lightbox. And is this your first year at TIFF? This is, no. Okay. This, I was a programmer for 17 years. Okay. I did, I'm a specialist in Latin American and Spanish and Portuguese cinema. Okay. So I've been doing that for many years. and With TIFF. With TIFF. And I've also been programming for quite a few other festivals. Mm-hmm. And um, I was recently given this promotion, I guess, four and a half months ago, five months ago, almost. So this is new. This is a new and exciting... It's a new position. It's a new position. So, so what prompted this new position then? I think that... We, um, well, there's a change in leadership, right? There's, it's a whole new, mm-hmm. exciting time to reimagine TIFF. Mm-hmm. And I'm just really excited and, and honored to. Yeah, it's a, it's like amazing uh, to be part of this new imagining of what TIFF can be. 
the Panama Panama Film Festival. Film Festival. How long were you part of that film festival? Well, I was part of it before it began. I was part of the founding team. I'm the founding artistic director. Mm-hmm. Um, that was an incredible experience, and I, and I still have cl- very close ties. We became the festival known for launching Central American and Caribbean cinema into the international Mm -hmm. film festival circuit and really providing that launch pad for Central American and, and Caribbean filmmakers. And we don't, but it was an international film festival, so we played alongside either films, uh, from the rest of the world, of course, and a really strong, um, Spanish language identity, which Mm. I think was, uh, it was key creating those, those ties in the region. Speaking of the Caribbean, I was born in the Caribbean, and there's also Caribbean Tales mm-hmm. Film Festival here in Toronto, and there is a relationship between Caribbean Tales and TIFF in regards to their pitches and using the, the TIFF Bell light box. Do you know anything? Can you shed any light into that, that relationship and how far do you think that relationship could go? Um. Yes, I've, I've been to the, the opening of Caribbean Tales and uh, to the breakfast that they have at TIFF, and I think it's a great opportunity to, to um, you know, really utilize all the people from all around the world that are here at TIFF and to shed the you know the spotlight on, on Caribbean cinema. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll see. This is something that's always in the it's works. New. It's it's new exactly. Yeah. So this is something that's always in the works, and and I do um, have a relationship with the people at Caribbean Tales, and I think it's uh, yeah. I saw their opening night uh, was just such a great film, mm. and it's, it's an exciting. It's exciting to have these partnerships yeah. with. Uh, these festivals all around the city when it comes to films especially films that are shown at the festival and with tiff throughout the year and other film festivals like caribbean tales Mm -hmm. like inside out how do you decide what films are going to be shown say at inside out and also be shown at tiff is there any sort of prioritizing in regards to what's shown at what festival? I think each festival does their own programming because okay. we're at such different times of the year. Um, if a film is ready to be shown at a certain time of year, it'll, that's usually how that that works. Okay. And, and is there any? Can there be any overlap? Like, would TIFF say program something that Inside Out has programmed as well when it comes to LGBT films? Right, we would definitely program in, at the building. Yes, de- definitely okay. program, pro- show something. We've uh, showed Rocket Man, yeah. for example, at the building that was shown at Inside Out, and then after, and we showed at TIFF as well. Okay, at the light okay. box. Yeah. Okay. The most challenging aspect about what it is that you're doing now for yourself. Um, the most challenging, I, I guess, is is uh, figuring out ways to to keep that festival spirit at, throughout the year, mm-hmm. I think. And that's what I'm most excited uh, about as well. So I think uh, we'll see. We'll see. This, these are early days. So I'm excited to see what's to come. Yeah. And, uh, and it's always nice to, to have a, a new challenge. And, and this position is, is definitely offering that. Is there anything that's coming up in the latter part of 2019, 2020, that you're looking forward to when it comes to films at the TIFF Bell Lightbox? I'm so looking forward to the Martin Scorsese retrospective that's going to be happening at the Lightbox. Um, it's like all his fiction features. Mm-hmm. And I think um, I love those opportunities to see the full breadth of an auteur's work. And it's great that we're going to be offering that at the Lightbox very soon. And the best aspect about what it is that you do with TIFF? It's, a, you know, I get to celebrate film, art, culture, community with people that I really enjoy working with. So it's uh, it's such a luxury to, to be able to have a job that you, you love and is um, enjoyable to do day to day. Diana Sanchez, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. How are you? Whoa. You guys are excited, aren't you? Hello, Toronto! This is a very...
very exciting night for us. I'm really freaking excited to be here tonight. What a great audience. I'm so, so excited to be here. It's such a great honor. And I'm so honored to be able to show my film to this august crowd. What's really fun is people who love film, and you are all that. And we're very proud and happy to be here with all of you. We should not be afraid to tell stories because we are afraid that people will judge. Thank you for giving us the opportunity and a platform to be able to showcase our work as female filmmakers. This is for my parents who couldn't come, so thank you. I'm going to prove it to them. I did it! I just realized what TIFF actually stands for. Toronto is fucking fantastic. <laughs> this is the story of our city, and we're a very proud city, and I want the world to see it. Hi, this is Michael Anthony Alago, music executive, photographer, author, and you are listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. No Ordinary Man, a new documentary that tells the story of trans jazz artist Billy Tipton. A few days ago, I caught up with co-directors Ashling Chin Yi and Chase Joint to find out more about No Ordinary Man. Ashling Chin Yi. Hi, how are you? I'm great. How are you doing? I am well. Chase Joint, how are you? I'm wonderful. Thanks so much for asking. Excellent. The the two of you are the co-creators, the co-directors of a new documentary, No Ordinary Man. But I always say this to my guests. First and foremost, welcome to the show to have your voices, your stories be heard by the LGBT community and beyond. So thank you so much for that, first and foremost. So the two of you are co-directors of the new documentary, No Ordinary Man, that's playing at TIFF 2020. Congrats on getting the film done. Thank you. Thank you. How are you feeling about the film? Excited. It's, um, you know, it's been... We've been we've been working on this movie for you know a year and a half more with Amos Mack as well and it's who is a co-writer on the film and it's just really exciting to launch our baby into the world. Ashling, let's let's stay with you here. When did you first hear about uh, Billy Tipton? That's the the subject of this new documentary. I first heard about Billy Tipton um, from our producer, Sarah Spring of Parabola Films. She was uh, interested in developing a project about him um, and, and was showing me like different material with Billy Jr. and different uh, and how Billy's Billy Jr. and his mother, Kitty Tipton were being absolutely vilified and Billy Tipton was being vilified on on talk shows in the late 1980s and in the early 90s. And it was clear that his story was being, you know, bastardized by by the mainstream media. So it opened up a curiosity um, to 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 learn more about him. Like I've always been attracted to telling stories about people who aren't always having their stories told properly about them or just not having their stories told at all. Um, So that was kind of the the, the, my first uh, introduction to him and then quickly started talking to Amos Mack, um, who had heard of Billy, you know, you know, before and had had known of him as a historical figure, a historical trans figure. And that's where the kind of idea and kind of, you know, started to really 
grow and kind of crystallize. And Chase joined for yourself. When did you first hear about Billy Tipton? You know, my answer to that question is in a lot of ways in chorus with so many of the participants in our documentary, which is to say, you know, as a trans man myself, Billy Tipton has always existed in the ether. You know, Billy Tipton has always been um, a fabulous haunting of a trans masculine person in history that, um, you know, many have made uh, a part of their own personal becoming, proof that people like us existed in, in, in decades prior. And then it was really through the invitation to join this project and the ongoing research that I began to understand Tipton's life and history in new ways. So, Ashling, the documentary No Ordinary Man, what is this documentary about? This documentary, it's about a lot of things, um, and we hope it's about a lot of things, but it's looking at the life of Billy Tipton, who was a uh, transmasculine jazz musician who, from Oklahoma City who came up in the 40s and 50s playing playing jazz music in small clubs, lounges, and touring around like that, you know, doing, going on to radio stations and stuff like this. And, and he, he lived a very successful life. He was married five times. And then after he died, it was outed, it was leaked and outed to the media that he was a transgender man. And after that, his story was changed to be, um, told that he was, uh, you know, he was basically an ambitious woman who wanted to play jazz so much that, he, that, uh, that they put on a pair of pants and a suit to, 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 to follow that dream. And it was, and basically our film is trying to understand his story through a array of different trans people's lenses um, to, to really explore who, who he was and also where, his story and its impact kind of sits today uh, in a contemporary in a contemporary place. Chase is always better at answering that question than I am, though. <laughs> oh, I think you hit so many of uh, so many of our speaking points. Yeah, I think you know <laughs> the the legacy of Billy Tipton has been controlled by the mainstream media, and in particular the talk show circuit. And so, together with our creative team, we thought, what would happen to the story of Billy Tipton if we told it from a trans perspective and, and centered the voices of those who were most impacted by the telling of this particular life story. So Chase, the documentary tells Billy Tipton's story th through current day trans artists. Why did you guys decide to use this approach for the documentary? You know, one of the things that I think we continue to say about history is that it is not a stable story, that in fact, the history we understand is just a repetition of stories by people who hold positions of power. And so what would we learn about Billy Tipton by inviting multiple people to the table to reflect on his significance? And because, you know, our understanding of transness and gender nonconformity is also not stable, what it meant to be a trans person in in the 1980s, for example, is very different from what it might mean to be a trans person in 2020. How could we create a much more kaleidoscopic portrait using Billy Tipton as our anchor? And so in some ways that returns to Ash's first reaction of, you know, what's the movie about? The movie's about a lot of things. Precisely that, that yes, we made a film about Billy Tipton, but we also made a film about what's at stake when you attempt to tell a story about a marginalized person in history. And Ashling, the documentary features Billy Tipton's story, Billy Tipton Jr. Talk to me about the process of getting Billy Tipton Jr. to be part of this documentary. Was it uh, easy, difficult? How was that journey? I mean, we were really lucky with Billy Jr. He has been, you know, since his father's passing, like he has been he's been the most vocal in defending his his father's legacy and defending his father's you know his father of being a, a a good a good father a good husband somebody who we loved somebody who should be revered in so many ways so when when we approached him about telling this story this the story in a documentary 
and not just in kind of the news clips that were that he was getting uh, victimized by in the in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, he was incredibly trusting and generous, and we spent, well, I think, four days in Spokane with him, getting to know him, looking at looking through all of his uh, memorabilia of his father, and and he was from from the start just always like you know, embraced us with open arms and and was incredibly generous with his father's music and and all of these things. So it really it really was a, a wonderful journey with him, actually. And the audio tapes that are part of the documentary, did those come through Billy Tipton Jr.? Some of them did. There's some of his recordings. Um, when we hear Billy's voice singing or talking, though, those were recordings that were done uh, for for live radio at one of his live performances or a couple of his live performances. So we got those from Billy Jr. But um, there was a biography that was written about Billy Tipton um, by this woman named Diane Middlebrook, who had done, uh, who told his story in a very problematic way, but like she did an incredible amount of research on his life. And so, and did tons of interviews, um, did, you know, really, really went around all over uh, the US where where Billy had, you know, been playing and, and touring around and living. And she had donated all of these interview recordings to Stanford University, which is where she taught. So we were able to, Amos Mack and I went to Stanford uh, about a year and a half ago, and we got to like dig through all of this research that was done by by, by Middlebrook um, and access to these, to hours of these interviews. So I'm calling this the, the, the talk show tour, so to speak. Uh, Billy Tipton's family, uh, his wife and son, Billy Tipton Jr., they were on essentially the, the talk show circuit on Oprah, on Sally, Jesse, Raphael, and others. Chase, I'm interested to know, they were doing these shows after Billy Tipton's passing, and a man that was so private in his life, did it surprise you that after his death, his family became so public with his with his story and everything that came out. Did that surprise you that such a private man in his passing, his family would become so public? Well, I think one of the important things to recognize about his family in those contexts is that they are trying to do right by him in many ways. And that's one of the things that I find most compelling about Billy Jr., both historically in that talk show footage and in the contemporary moment as he continues to reflect on his father's life is that his narrative is unchanging, that he had a father who he loved and that he spent important time with throughout his childhood. And we can watch the way Kitty, one of Billy's partners, says he was a man, he was a father, he was a loving person who deserved respect. You know, I think what we experience in that talk show montage, though, is the violence of the medium itself. So we understand that in this moment in the 80s and 90s, the presence of trans people on talk shows was a circus spectacle. And, you know, the questions of trans, uh, asked of trans and gender nonconforming people on these shows focused on essentially three things, genitals, pain, and deception. And so the family is being put through the same machine as some of the trans subjects. But I do think that they exist there in defense of their father and in, de in defense of their partner. And uh, even while, you know, they could be seen or interpreted by some as contributing to to the spotlight. But they had to go public to to try to clear his name. I think that's right. And I think that that is, if we look back, I think that that is what motivated some of their ongoing appearances. So there's a, there's a term that's uh, well, no longer in use, but I have to say personally, I love it. And the term is this, female husbands. And there's a great book out called Female Husbands by author Jen Mannion, and she's been a guest on the show. And essentially, the book recounts stories of women who lived their lives as men, even being married to other women, dating back to the 1700s. Fast forward to Billy Tipton and his story in the 40s and the 50s. Ashling, I'm interested to know, 
Did you guys get any insight while doing this documentary as to why Billy Tipton did what he did? How he got that strength to do what he did? Because we're talking about the 40s, the 50s. There weren't role models back then of people really, truly living their truths. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the thing that we don't have any diaries from Billy. We don't have anything that says, oh, this is exactly what he was thinking to answer the questions that we're asking in the film. So that's why we we wanted to not make something that said just told one story or one way that we imagine he, you know, um, why he lived his life in the way that he lived his life, apart from the fact that he lived it, you know, very honestly and authentically as a man and the people all everyone who loved and knew him um knew he was a man and that was that's the record we have to go off of you know so it's um so in in that it's like that's why we wanted to tell it from this like chase says like this kaleidoscope of of experiences because there isn't you know we can't point at like well this is his final testimonial about all the things he's ever he's ever thought or Mm -hmm. the truths he's ever wanted to live but but we hope that we hope that in this in this film that we're able to restore you know his the 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 respect that that the people that loved him had for him and that people who knew him knew him as this very like loving and giving person um who was also very talented as a musician and also was so many other things because our lives are quite are are more complex than just one motivation to do any one thing. And I think it really speaks to the human spirit and the strength of the human spirit, right? Back in the 40s and the 50s, the, the strength that he would have to have to do what he did. And I think one of the things that's interesting, even if you bring up the, the book Female Husbands, is that the subtitle of that book is a, a trans history, right? And what I love about that is this sort of expansiveness of what's possible under the umbrella term of trans. And, and as we were journeying with our various interview subjects, the question was never, was Billy Tipton a trans person? Can we lock this into place? And can we get to the truth of his potential identificatory past, right? It was more what's at stake in asking these questions or what does it mean to look back from our contemporary moment and think, you know, is there someone here that, that I can find meaning with, right? And enduring meaning. And, and I think that there's a kind of slipperiness there that's, that's very productive. I love the moment in the film where Thomas Page McVie says, you know, it's important that we can look back, but we might be wrong. Or, you know, when Amos Mack says, I don't think Billy was thinking in the way we're thinking now. And all of these moments being okay to have trans men reflecting on on their history, even if it is is speculative. How would I summarize the story of Billy Tipton? He was a transmasculine jazz musician. Pretty simple. The first phrase that always comes to my mind is the gentleman's gentleman. You know, just uh, the consummate professional and the gentleman's gentleman. The first time that I learned about Billy Tipton was probably 2003 or 2004. Um, Just before I started my medical transition, I was doing a ton of research at that that point. And so I wanted to learn about uh, my ancestors essentially that came before me. In a way, Billy has been with me um, in sort of the background before my transition and thinking about him again from the place of being a trans man was very interesting for me because I think I had held him, um, you know, in, in just a sort of general context of queerness prior to that. So Chase, I'm interested to know, do you know of Jackie Shane? Of course, absolutely. So talk to me about the choice to do this documentary about Billy Tipton. Why particularly Billy Tipton? I felt very grateful to be welcomed into a project in motion. And my part of my motivation was not only the knowledge of Sarah Spring and Ashling's attachment, but the presence of Amos Mack, who is our co-writer. Amos was responsible for the publication of a magazine called Original Plumbing, which was in existence from 2008 to 2018, if I'm 
correct on my dates. And it was a very, you know, incredibly influential text to me in my early coming of age as uh, a trans masculine person. And I felt really strongly that my participation in, in elevating and thinking in complex ways about Belly Tipton was a way to contribute to um, the ongoing uh, publicness of trans masculine history. So Ashling, Chase, how do, you, how do the two of you know each other? Did you know each other prior to this project? No, but I think we've known each other in other lives, though. <laughs> like, uh, like, and I'm not joking about that. Um, we were introduced through mutual friends, and um, and 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 Chase and Amos knew each other, obviously, as Chase has said. And when we started to work together, we just like synced up like immediately, and it was it was like you know we're we were we saw the ways of making film, like the, the, you know, how we wanted to like really push the ways of narrative filmmaking and how we wanted to use the documentary form and this ideas that we all, that we wanted to explore in this and the questions we were asking and how we wanted to do that just were, you know, we were lockstep like the entire, the entire time. Like I think within the first 10 minutes that Chase and I met, we had matching luggage and I'm not kidding about that. (laughs) Um, But yeah, it's uh, so, so no, we didn't know each other before this project, but we will know each other for the rest of our lives. And, and talk to me about, Chase, talk to me about the decision to co-direct. How did that come about? Uh-huh, absolutely. I feel like collaboration is my most enduring creative methodology. You know, people always say, how is it possible that you're going to co-direct something? And And <clears throat> I always say it's, the most joyful process and it requires you know a leap of faith and trust in another's insights and expertise and i think to, to ash's many points it was a circumstance where we both humbly and openly came to the table and said here are the things that i think i'm really good at here are the things that i feel you know uh you're really good at or here are the ways in which our skill sets could complement and it was about hitting the ground and by that i mean arriving on set in research and even in post really trusting in each other's um, insights and processes. And it's through the collaboration of those various points of view that we came to create the film that, that you just saw. I really do feel like it is a wild hybrid blend of our artistic approaches and identifications. So how, how to go a bit deeper than that, how did it work on set was would one take the lead when you guys were on set and in post the other one took the lead? Talk to me about that, Ashling, if you could. Yeah. So, I mean, we, this, the whole movie was essentially made in, in with nine days of shooting, we were casting in Los Angeles, New York. Um, We did interviews in, we did all the interviews in those two cities as well. And then we spent uh, a few days in Spokane, Washington with Billy Jr. Um, and so we always had a two camera set up wherever we went. And so one of the things was, was, you know, when we were split up in the, in the casting, we had, I was in the audition re- auditions with Amos and Chase was, you know, was out with another camera, like kind of curating the conversations that were happening in the waiting room. Um, so we were able to kind of like kind of divide and conquer in a kind of way. And then when we were doing the interviews, it's it, because of for so many reasons, it made so much more sense for our subjects to be talking to Chase rather than talking to me. So we, you know, I was like, don't worry about the image. I'll make sure it looks good. <laughs> Chase, you make sure that, <laughs> that we get the content that we're hoping for and follow the follow the routes down that we you know, the, the different pathways of, of topics and things that we're interested in. Um, and so we were always checked in with each other. You know, we always, we had like kind of an un, unspoken language on like how, where each other were in the room and what we were doing, but it was, we split up those tasks, you know, based on, on, you know, like she said, like what, what each of us can kind of, kind of came to the table with. as a What your strengths set. were, your individual strengths. Yeah. And then, you know, in post, we benefit greatly from the fact that Ash is our editor. And so it is an unbelievable privilege and gift to work with her across a variety of different forms. And so we were able to stay closely tied as she was cutting in the back room of her house for the many months, many, many months <laughs> that followed. 
How long was the shoot for the? You said it was a handful of days, but in terms of the overall pre-production, shooting, post-production, how long did this whole project take? Uh, when we came on board of it, um, it started, I would say, in like the in the sort of late winter, spring of 2019. Um, Amos and I started writing it, you know, in earnest in around February of 2019. And then we, uh, you know, and then Chase joined the team quite quickly after that. And then we started shooting it in last summer. Uh, we went, that's when we did our two main shoots in LA and New York last July and August. Uh, and then we went to Spokane in October. And the post-production essentially started uh, after that shoot in October, in mid-October, and has taken us all the way till today, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> We're just finishing the film, so, yeah. And the use of auditions in the film, in the documentary. Chase, talk to me about that and why the use of that, because it's very interesting some of the the people auditioning to be Billy Tipton and one of them even being a black person. Talk to me about that whole process about uh, using uh, auditions to to get his story across, Billy Tipton's story across. Absolutely. So in early phases of the project, a casting call went out for trans masculine talent with the explicit instruction that they were coming to participate in a documentary as themselves and not auditioning for a role or the fantasy future of, of a fiction film. And so what that meant was we already understood that there was trans masculine actors who were walking in ready to talk and be themselves in pursuit of a project potentially about Billy Tipton. And one of the things that I love about the casting process that reveals itself on screen is that you watch how Ashley and I in particular lose control of our own story in service of the story that the various actors bring into the room. So we really follow the lead of Marquise or follow the lead of Alex when they are reflecting upon not only their relationship to Tipton as a historical subject, but their relationship to the idea of Billy Tipton as a role that they might play or embody or inhabit. And of course, there's many sort of meta geeky layers to a little bit of embedded commentary on, you know, cis people playing trans roles and trans actors needing more spotlight on their incredible talent. Um, and so functioning in a variety of different ways at once. Marquise really stood out to me. Marquise is a star. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and I, w I was thinking what he ended up saying partway through about his being a person of color. It was, f well, it was well done. So well done. So well, well done. You know, since we have the time, I'll tell you a, a quick story about encountering Marquise in the process, which is that Ash and I were in New York looking at the casting tapes coming in from the call. And in, you know, I would say halfway down the list, we watched a, watched a clip from Marquise and it was just electric. I mean, as dynamic in a self tape as he is on screen in our film. And I immediately connected the dots that Marquise is also a featured subject in an early documentary from the 2000s called The Aggressives. Um, and which is, you know, one of the few documentary portraits of the time that feature trans men of color. And I immediately, you know, felt electric in my brain thinking about the interactivity of Marquise in a story like this, who gets featured what does it mean to be tell to be telling complicated stories about trans masculine histories? I am just like bouncing off the walls and Ashley is like trying to follow my body around the room. And we reach out to him and we're like, can we hang out with you for a second and see if what we're doing is of interest? And, uh, you know, he so generously, I think like interrupted uh, a rehearsal that he was in um, for another project to come and hang out with us. And he's, just not only such a dynamic performer and such a generous human, but as someone who is really deeply interested in trans masculine histories and, um, and was excited by the potentials of, of walking toward a conversation with us. And I love his, his, 
his out loud processing um, throughout the film as he sort of locates himself mm. both within and against the material. Yeah. Ashling, when it comes to no ordinary man, most challenging part about doing this documentary? Oh, I mean, I think it's, I mean, I think the whole film, what we wanted to try to say with you, with telling Billy's story and what we wanted to represent and how we wanted to tell the story, it was really just, I, I'm in the challenging, but I think we we had a lot of fun rising to the challenge. Was just like, how do we map this story out in a way that will feel like we're talking to a multiple amount of audiences? We are also telling we're we're not we're telling Billy's story, but we're also telling a story of what it is to be a trans masculine person today, and to just like find the balance of those things and find the right thread to to tell these stories. And also, of course, like in, 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 in weaving in Billy Jr.'s own experience, because he's the only person in the film who you know, knew Billy, and how to do that in a way that felt like organic and the journey felt right, and that we were flowing from one idea to another. And that was, you know, I think that that was the most challenging part of it. And to make sure that we're being, that we're also telling an emotional story that we're satisfied and we feel something for the people in this film and for Billy himself when we get to the end of it so it was yeah it's not it wasn't uh it wasn't obvious from you know the first day of shooting where we would kind of end up but but you know we we got there through a lot of post-it notes was there (laughs) was there any any pushback when it came to uh the people that that hold the, the 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 power the money Anything like that? Was there any pushback to that from from powers that be when it I mean, comes luckily, to funding the the project? Uh, well, luckily, our producer Sarah Spring is a very convincing person, so she was able to, you know, while we were busy making the film, was able to kind of bring along the the the, the funders and the financiers and the partners up to mm-hmm. speed for all like all the things we were trying to do and. And was just like trust, you know, she's a very experienced producer. And so there was a lot of trust in like what she was going to deliver a great film that that she trusted us that we were going to deliver a good film. And that and that, of course, there's there have, you know, people are asked, you know, it's a it's a movie that, is, you know, it sparks a lot of questions. So there was definitely some back and forth there. But for the most part, from where Chase and I uh, stand, you know, vantage point was was that we were very protected by the process and that we were also supported um, by all the partners and financiers and funders that, uh, that, that came on board. And Chase, what's the overall, uh, where's this film heading once it's done the, the festival circuit, that sort of thing? Well, we have an exciting festival tour that continues to gain momentum. Um, many of which we are, not allowed to announce quite yet, but we're feeling very, very excited about its um, its ongoing showcases. And you know, our goal is to get the project in the living rooms and on the screens and in front of the eyes of as many people as possible. And so um, we, uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't know what the the concluding sentence to that is, but uh, we're not going to stop. You know, to to the point about. Uh, 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 funding. We live in a, a culture and a climate where, you know, people say films about trans content are hard to sell. And we as a team just believe that that's a wholly unacceptable mm. uh, statement. And uh, we will not be kept down. Heck, I <laughs> love that. We will not be kept down. Powerful words. Ashling Chin Yi. I hope I didn't mess up your name throughout this interview. Not at all. You said it perfectly. <laughs> and and Chase joined. I hope I said your name correctly. You did indeed. <laughs> thank you both for being on the show. And thank you for, I've seen the documentary. Well done. Powerful. Moving. Well done to both of you and to everyone involved. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.
for all things TIFF, which runs until September 20th, TIFF.net. Hi, my name is Joanne Vanicola, and I'm an actor and a writer, and I was first on Rainbow Country with Mark Tara on discussing the massacre at Pulse Club in, in Orlando. Um, I realized how important it was for our community to have a radio station, uh, specifically for our issues, to, to talk about people in, in the LGBTQ community and to provide a, an outlet for our stories, um, to discuss uh, our politics, culture, and give voice to the, to the issues that matter to us. And, of course, our artists and, and um, the things that we do globally and, and talk about culture. And without people like Mark Tara uh, providing a space for this with, with a radio show like this, then uh, we wouldn't have that voice. So, support. Tune in. Thank you. Bill 7. To ban discrimination in employment, government services, and housing based on a person's sexual orientation, was up for a vote at Queen's Park. Most NDP and Liberal MPPs supported the bill, but without some progressive conservative legislators' backing, a divisive split could rack the province. Four PCs decided to break party ranks to vote with their conscience and support Bill 7. Cabinet Minister and MPP Dennis Timbrell did it to show solidarity for his beloved brother, the well-known drag queen, Rusty Ryan. And for me, a gay politician who was not yet out, I had to take a stand. We were known as the Gang of Four. I'm former cabinet minister and MPP, Phil Gillies. The date, December 2nd, 1986, when LGBT rights came to Ontario. Hi, this is Police Constable Danielle Botno, also known as LGBT Cop, and you're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Terra. This is Hour 2 of Rainbow Country, where I feature music from LGBT recording artists, independent recording artists, plus voices that you know and love in classic disco, classic 80s, classic house. So if you stay with me, if you stick with me, I hope you think I'm bringing you music worth hearing. Starting us off, a three-song 80s set.
Chinese graffiti. Radio silence. Don't walk past a three-song Blue Peter set featuring a great Canadian 80s band, Blue Peter. For more on Blue Peter, check out their website, bluepeterband.com. Up next, a three-song folk set.
Spider, Fly, Long Haul, featuring Jennifer Nettles from the country duo Sugarland, a three-song folk set featuring Emily Saliers from Indigo Girls. That is off of her current solo record called Murmuration Nation. For all things Saliers, emilysaliers.com. Up next, a three-song subversive set. Kiss, blood, red wine, 
Black Lipstick Kiss, Shame, 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 and The Morning After Kill, a three-song subversive set featuring Canadian band, Random Order. For all things order, randomorder.ca. Up next, a three-song alternative set.
Garbage Truck, 4 a.m. Waiting for You, a three song alternative set featuring Dinosaur from their current full length record, Eleven. For all things soul, dinosaurmusic.com. And next, a three song electronic set. Get it into your head I'm not yours cause you ain't my dad Got a coat on back that reads nine Your nail shooter up on my spine Push my chest down slowly Feel the rush of air as we rise So happy to be alive Happy to be alive Happy to be alive Yeah, I, I, I Place in my head, I'm not yours, no, my thoughts are red. Don't like dreams, cause they are not mine. My code dictates what I like. Push my cheeks down slowly, feel the rush of air as we rise. <laughs> Give up. 
up your panties so but i don't wanna be alone talking boys out on my phone bring your lotion let's get going to the totem pole that beacon yo to the totem pole that beacon though uh. what's your name again Featuring BC native Ian Mannix. For all things Mannix, Ian Mannix on Bandcamp. Don't forget to keep up to date with all things country, rainbow country. Follow me on socials at Mark Tara Music. Do you have a guest suggestion, maybe a show idea? Send me an email because I would love to hear from you. Mark at MarkTara.com. The podcast for Rainbow Country is available on all major platforms. The official Rainbow Country playlist is out on Spotify. And everything is hooked up at marktara.com. Finally, I want to take this time to thank you for taking your time to be with me. Remember, stay strong, stay well, stay safe. Hi, everybody. This is Gino Vanelli. You're listening to Rainbow Country with Mark Tara. <laughs>